One day there was this 12-year-old boy named Moses uh, that I'd made friends with. He was admitted to the male ward. He was one of these cases that uh, on the third day after the staff had actually reported that he was getting better and his condition was stabilizing, uh, he died three hours later after I'd left the hospital. There was some internal bleeding the staff wasn't aware of and they had no idea that his heart rate was rapidly increasing, his blood pressure was rapidly decreasing and uh, he ended up dying. And I went back in the next day and I found out and I was pissed <laughs> because in my mind I knew uh, without a doubt that he never would have died in the most basic facility in Canada. And so it became a human rights issue to me, it became a social justice issue to me. Because what, by virtue of being born in that facility, in this community, does that justify and make it okay that he can die there when he never would have to die here? And the answer was no, of course not. So I saw basic diagnostic medical equipment as a way to address this issue and empower the staff to be able to provide care for their patients and save somebody like Moses. Kelly's story is not unlike the countless told by dedicated volunteers and organization leaders across Canada who have created special projects, charities, and nonprofits to address crucial medical equipment needs around the globe. To date, Canadian Goodwill has provided critical medical equipment to over 48 countries. From frontline equipment to more complex and larger devices, Donations address everything from basic health care to supporting a healthy community, the value of which is considerable. This simplistic act of generosity is actually overwhelmingly complex, posing numerous hurdles that donors and recipients face to ensure equipment arrives safe and sound. So we do a lot of due diligence in equipment acquisition to ensure that we're only providing the medical equipment that has the durability and robustness to last and function for years at a time in the conditions in, in northern Ghana that you'll find. Our primary sources are manufacturers and medical equipment charities that receive mass amounts of equipment donations from hospitals, from manufacturers, and then they deal it out to the smaller charities. 85% of our equipment is brand new and unused, which is fantastic. The remaining 10 to 15 percent that isn't. If it's equipment that needs to be plugged in, that's slightly more comprehensive, like an oxygen concentrator, it has to be certified by a biomedical engineer that it has functionality to ensure that we're not providing something that will spoil when it goes over. Because equipment graveyards are a huge issue in resource poor countries that receive mass donations pretty frequently and they have no way of disposing of uh, expired equipment so they just pile up. Medical equipment graveyards are a grim reminder and symptomatic of the challenges that face the donation process, often blockading hospital floors, creating landfills, and placing undue pressure on a system that is already heavily taxed. Too often, the majority of this charitable act goes to waste. Donating poorly functioning equipment at the outset is one of the reasons that donations can go awry. Research has shown that Canadian organizations often fail when it comes to inspecting equipment and checking for compatibility of electricity supply. When donations are received, few organizations ask for confirmation that the equipment arrived in working order or are provided status reports on the functionality of the equipment over time. Donating equipment that isn't truly needed can also lead to poor outcomes. I think it's immensely important to stick to the research that you've done. So even though we have offers of all types of items, sometimes expired, sometimes not, it's extremely important to still say, you know, these are the research items that we know are the most needed in our hospitals. And going away from that means you're gonna be providing things they don't really need, and they don't have a way again to safely dispose of. It's easy to fall into this top-down donor approach where you have a lot of sources of medical supplies and you're looking for a place to give them. And I don't find that's necessarily the most effective way because then sometimes you're projecting somebody's needs for them and that can create errors in the impact your projects is gonna have. So with all this generosity and support to nations around the globe, how can Canadians improve? How can we strengthen a system that has tremendous impact on a person's health and a community's sustainability? 
Ideally, any donation initiative should be part of an ongoing partnership consisting of three core elements. Consultation, ensuring that the needs of the recipient are well understood and have been established through a consultation with all parties involved. Planning and process, having a clear donation plan identified and agreed to in advance by all stakeholders. Monitoring and follow-up, perhaps the most important element is a sustained and supportive relationship with the recipient institution, ensuring long-term success and impact. I think it's important to work with a researcher if it's possible because they'll just ask questions that maybe you're not used to thinking of um, and they'll keep you in check to ensure that the projects are meeting a sustainable end or are reflecting an express need that you're not targeting things and slipping into what's easy. Teaming yourself up with other individuals, other corporations that are critical and that are always going to try to make your projects as strong as possible is always a sure bet to uh, success. For more guidance on all of the steps involved in an effective donation process, several online resources are available, including the World Health Organization's guideline document and the Tropical Health Education Trust's Making It Work Toolkit. Because what starts as goodwill and a desire to make things better should ultimately create an equally promising outcome.